Well, good afternoon and welcome to MedTech Crossroads. I'm Gene Paranak. Today is episode 55, uh, Friday, April 30th, 2021. Today, we're going to do our usual COVID news. After that, it's going to be Margarita Hernandez from Ann Arbor Spark. Then it's Medical Device Development Month. That's what we're calling the month of May. And guess what? We're getting started a day early with this segment, which we're going to call It's Compelling, But Does It Work? After that, Q&A and check-ins. And we're looking forward to uh, doing all that with you today. So thanks for being here. First up, though, what I want to do is talk about the COVID news. We've been showing uh, this set of slides updated each week and the transmission level by county in the state of Michigan, about as bad as we've ever seen it. Um, I think there's one county that doesn't have a red uh, transmission level uh, spreading like wildfire. Of course, what's really interesting about that, Michigan's still a hot spot by transmission uh, in the nation, but many are actually in that red zone right now. What is fascinating still is that it's, when you look at the hospitalizations, Michigan is definitely a red zone. That is coming down though. Right now we are still for probably the third or fourth week in a, lo in a row uh, in dead last place in the country for hospitalizations. But that being said, uh, those numbers are thankfully coming down. Hospitalizations, deaths came up a little bit, but thankfully nowhere near where they did last December. Most importantly, that positivity rate, that orange line has been dropping off, which is just wonderful news. As we've said, uh, a lot of that has to do with the demographic difference between this and prior waves that 40 to 69-year-old uh, demographic uh, really carrying this wave uh, much more survivable in the, in the middle to lower uh, ages. So even though that peak is as high for total new COVID-19 hospital admissions as it was back at the end of last year, um, it's a different demographic that it seems to be happening uh, with. Nationally, in terms of the vaccine, uh, there's the numbers. Uh, it looks like uh, not many states up to 40% totally vaccinated, uh, but um, certainly quite a few in the 30s and 40s having received at least one or more doses. Now you probably heard nationally that the rate of vaccinations has started dropping off for a variety of reasons. You can see that there in the tail of the graph on the bottom right. What was a nice straight line with the exception of a February drop off um, is now starting to drop again. So we'll see where that goes. I wanted to bring you this also because there's been this question all along. I think when this all started, everyone would have said uh, getting a disease is the same as uh, a vaccine. It's like the best vaccine. And doc in fact, Dr. Philip Levy uh, told us exactly that. He said, getting a disease is about as good as a vaccine is. It's the, it, he's not recommending it, not recommending getting the disease, but saying it should have the same effect. Um, this out of the Lancet, which is a, they did a 25,000 person reinfection study in the UK. The title of the study, SARS-CoV-2 infection rates of antibody positive compared with antibody negative healthcare workers in England, a large multi-center prospective cohort study, starting to answer the question of does immunity happen and does it last? And really fascinating in their study, this graph really summarizes it, that the reinfections, which is the light blue line, didn't come back up in the population that had gotten infected previously. Compared to a cohort that had not been infected previously, that's the red line going up. Their interpretation at the end of their study, and again, a very prominent journal, a 25,000 person study, a previous history of SARS-CoV-2 infection was associated with an 84% lower risk of infection with median protective effect observed seven months following primary infection. This time period is the minimum probable effect because seroconversions were not included. This study shows that previous infection with SARS-CoV-2 induces effective immunity to future infections in most individuals. So this is hopeful news. We're thankful for the vaccines that are getting out there. Um, we're also thankful for this kind of news uh, coming out of the Lancet with such a, a thorough study. So that's the COVID news for today. A few announcements here before we get to our guest. The first is Into Being is looking for an embedded systems developer. We'd love it if you'd pass that news along. 
and uh, primary role is microcontroller firmware design. So let folks know about that. Also reminding you that at the end of June, we're going to be doing the next installment of the MedTech Crossroads Pitch Party. It's not a pitch competition, it's a party. We have a good time with it. And at the end, we're gonna be awarding a $2,500, up from $1,000, a $2,500 prize. Our judges for this, as usual, Andy Rader, Dr. Nikki Kennedy, Jim Metzger, and Stacy Frankovich, who have been just a joy to work with on this project. So we'll see them again, uh, actually at the end of May and then at the end of June for the pitch party judging. If you want to be part of the pitch party, here's how you do it. US-based med tech startups are eligible for consideration regardless of their stage. Each startup gets 10 minutes at the end of a show and near the end of the quarter, that's the end of June, our panel will judge them, uh, mostly telling what they liked and what they didn't like, hat tipping towards one who will receive from into being that prize of $2,500. So send pitch decks to pitchparty at medtechcrossroads.org to be eligible for selection. Uh, two more notes here. One is that the FDA education uh, part of the Into Being site is up and running with many segments from MedTech Crossroads, where we've talked about things like 13485 and 21 CFR 820 and how you do risk and all those things. So if you need a primer on any of those subjects, feel free to go to intobeing.com, make your way down through the webinar segment, and you'll get to that FDA education portion. You can also find past episodes. You can find people we've talked to by scrolling through the MedTech Crossroads part of um, the webinars tab there at intobeing.com. Finally, this announcement from our friends. Uh, we received this from Phil and Jennifer. Thank you both for sending this along. Uh, the Medical Design and Manufacturing West Expo. I know it's a trade show I've been to before. Our friends at the Michigan Economic Development Corporation are planning to deploy a booth presence at MDM West, currently slated for August 10th through 12th in Anaheim, and it is a huge, huge show. It has been in previous years. It sounds like they're heading back in that direction this year. People from many countries, and they are hoping to host six small companies at a booth targeting representation from different regions throughout the state of Michigan. Free trip, not, I'm sorry, not free trip, free hosting at MDNM West uh, with some grant funding uh, eligible for that. Here's what they're looking at. Companies, uh, medical device companies in optical instrument and lens manufacturing, electromedical and electrotherapeutic apparatus manufacturing, analyt analytical laboratory instrument manufacturing, surgical and medical instrument manufacturing, surgical appliance and supplies manufacturing, dental equipment and supplies manufacturing, and ophthalmic goods manufacturing. So Tino and Mark would uh, love to get your email uh, right down at the bottom of that um, there. If you uh, need to find this again, go back to the MedTech Crossroads archives, find your way to this slide uh, from today's show, and you'll have those email addresses right there. We'll leave them up for just a moment more. And with that, I want to welcome my guest to the show. Today, we have Margarita Hernandez, who is the Director of Entrepreneurial Services for Ann Arbor Spark. Welcome, Margarita. Hey, Gene. How are you? It's good to see you. Thanks for being good here today. Thank you, too. <laughs> We're still enjoying the Zoom world. Yep. But it's a nice day. Look outside. <laughs> Get Go out there outside. and do some stuff. Yes. Well, Mar Margarita, we're going to talk all today about um, your background. Of course, you've got a, a PhD in, the, in biology and related sciences. You've done the startup thing. You've done the, um, the incubator and accelerator thing. You've sort of seen the whole ecosystem. I want to get into that. Uh, but we were having some fun earlier because um, cows, Margarita, cows and fish. Like, so I, I've got experience in goats and chickens. That's the extent of my knowledge but uh, your history takes you back to Texas where everything is bigger. Just, Tell us about the cows and the fish. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so originally I, I'm from Texas. Um, I grew up on the Gulf Core, on the Gulf Bay Coast actually. So I was born in Corpus Christi, Texas. And um, my dad's a deep sea fisherman. 
and a lot of his family. And so I would go out with him and that was like a regular thing that we would do. Sometimes on the weekends we would go out. My family also has a ranch out in South Texas. It was about an hour away from Corpus. And so a lot of my beginnings just really started with fishing and understanding the concepts and kind of being humble for what you catch, um, eating that and bringing that home. And then learning about how to kind of run a family business with cows uh, and the challenges that you get with cows. And it was funny because, you know, between learning how to fish with my dad and enjoy my time with him, learning about cows was a more serious business. And that was, they took a very different approach into how to use their property um, or at this ranch. It was from having growing corn, white corn. They were one of the first farmers to actually grow corn and watermelons and have pecan orchards. But they also started developing a very, because of the heat in this part of the state of Texas, it can be really challenging to have cattle out there. And so it would get really hot. And eventually uh, we started kind of genetically kind of picking cows and crossing cows that were more, they're hardier to stand within the heat um, in the property there on the ranch. So what we ended up breeding was a cow called a St. Augustine cow, St. Gertrudis cow, um, very hardy cow cross between an Angus um, and an Indian half. And the cow gets pretty big. They're beautiful. They're, they're smart, believe it or not. Um, sometimes they're scared of their shadows, but that's not on them. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of uh, the, my beginnings. And that's... my time... <laughs> It's funny that's, because my time at their ranch really was an important aspect um, towards my very early career of what goes on at the ranch, what's happening underneath the rocks, how do you how do you grow cows, what's going on with genetics, and so it kind of set me up for the beginning parts of being a young scientist. That is so cool. It gave you the interest <laughs> in the biological sciences, and then also I think you know when you and I were talking earlier, and I'm sure we'll get into this in a minute. Um, there's something real about animals you know if they live or die and you want to keep them alive and you want to take care of them. So there's a real fundamental bottom line is, is this animal sitting there thriving or is it not? And I think there's an interesting relation there to startups in the conversations that you and I have had. Yep, definitely. They definitely, uh, the, my time in my family uh, with this ranch was a very important aspect of my development and met so much the fact, uh, so when we were talking about earlier, I have a PhD from University of Michigan. Um, and the story of my PhD, it's very really challenging to tell uh, you know, a normal audience. My dad was there, my sisters, I've had friends that were like not in science. So I had to figure out a way or a parallel of how to be able to translate, how do people understand what I'm talking about, what I'm doing. And that story or my dissertation was really focused um, just, I call it the meiotic cowboy. So I studied meiosis in, in graduate school and the protein I was studying is more like a cowboy, um, corralling cows, you know, working with horses to kind of corral cows or go get cows from one point, San Antonio, Texas, all the way to San Francisco. My grandfather was doing a lot of that way back, um, just to kind of give parallels to people of what I was studying and what is it doing and how is it beneficial? Mm. Um, so I kind of took that first kind of story, big leap into, I got to continue to help people translate and understand what's going on and how are they going to look at it. Um, and I do that every day, not just with science, but definitely communicating with a number of the clients, uh, the startups and the companies that I support here at Ann Arbor Spark. That's awesome. Well, walk <laughs> us through a little bit of this history, Margarita, because um, you've, you've gone a, a road that, um, you know, it, it's really plowing back into companies. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes to go, um, you know, you're, you're at the top of the scientific field and then to say, no, I'm actually going to, I'm, I'm going to take the hard road because it's easy to go, you know, back into academia and do something. Uh, tell us about your PhD and then how you made the, the trek um, to these organizations. You were with uh, Fast Forward Medical Innovation before Ann Arbor Spark. Of course, a lot of great people over at FFMI. Now with Ann Arbor Spark, how did this, how did this process develop in your career? Sure. Um, so I've always... I've always been a curious person, which meant I always really like enjoy learning. Um, and for some reason, this has always stuck with me. So the curiosity killed the cat. And I've always approached life in a little bit differently of the satisfaction brought it back. And so I've applied that to a lot of my career. Uh, I started my undergraduate um, in microbiology and immunology at the University of Texas in San Antonio, where I was studying fungus. 
And then I used that as kind of my first kind of legs to going towards a PhD. And so I applied at University of Michigan, mm -hmm. lots of other few different universities, but Michigan, I already had a lot of connections. There was, it was friendly compared to a lot of other schools. So that's ultimately a reason I was like, I wanted a similar culture like Austin, Texas, because I ended up moving there too at some point in my life. And mm -hmm. Ann Arbor was definitely that kind of community and University of Michigan created a lot of that friendly, you know, ability for me to be able to survive going through culture shock and everything else. So yeah, U of M did it for me. But while at U of M, I started an infectious disease um, in some amount of like immunology, finding the right lab. And then a lot of life challenges kind of happened to me personally, where I ended up switching my my interests to more of molecular, cellular, and developmental biology, predominantly looking at chromosome dynamics during meiosis, during these really sensitive times where our chromosomes have to go these changes. And if they don't go do it right, I mean, there's these, that's where you see, you know, a mom loses a baby, for example, or chromosomal defects, like they have to try so many. So I went and started working on my PhD, continued out with my curiosity, um, but, Shortly thereafter, I really realized I didn't want to be at the bench. Um, I started working on a certificate in public policy, um, science and technology public policy through at U of M. I was also involved with nanomaterials, nano development for medicine uh, with Jim Baker. And then sort of shortly from there, I, one of my friends uh, was just a little bit more into startups and companies and working with McKinsey. And she was like, do some case studies. So I started doing some mm. case studies which kind of led to another thing, to another thing and another thing. And I bit the entrepreneurial bug. So by the time I graduated, um, I became a mom and there was like, okay, I need to get real about what this looks like. I bit the entrepreneurial bug and realized I really wanted to get into tech. And that whole ability, what really drove it was seeing something go from the scientific you know, lab, the bench, all the way into the hands of the person. Mm. What does that process look like? That's where I really was like, what, what goes on? Because it wasn't one story that wasn't consistent. There wasn't one way they had to do it. So then how does it work? Um, and so really my first job out uh, for my PhD was working for Fast Forward Medical Innovation. Now, for those of you who don't know what Fast Forward Medical Innovation, it's basically, um, I don't want to say basic, but it's the medical school's incubator where they focus on life sciences, med device, therapeutics, diagnostics, um, and software IT. Going through commercialization uh, there at the University of Michigan, trying to find the commercialization pathways for themselves. There's funding, there's guidance, there's a, a number of things that kind of help, you know, the researcher, the fellow, the postdoc, a variety of people who are developing something in life science to kind of get through the commercialization process to really help solidify that, that those things so that they can grow well. Um, and so there's lots of examples that exist in our ecosystem kind of where the beginning started and kind of getting to this point. I, you know, I was in the time when, right when Mike Klein was joined Genomenon, for example, this is when Parabrix was still really young. I remember going to a lot of the commercialization education um, stuff where David Olson was literally just mm -hmm. lecturing. And it was just such a very nurturing, informative space. I really valued my time there at Fast Forward Medical Innovation. But also from there, um, my main job was actually to run a program for students who wanted to, medical students who wanted to learn about commercialization and kind of helping them understand this is what a, an idea looks like, help them come up with an idea, kick the tires on that. And then what kind of steps do they need to start thinking about after that? It's just to a, a primer for a lot of that stuff. I grew the program from a handful of students to a large population of them. And it still is in existence today. A lot of them have graduated and gone on to uh, fellowships and whatnot. But um, one of those students actually was Michael Moore. Um, and that's actually my next kind of big jump into my first startup uh, with Pathware was with Michael Moore. He was one of the students there. So I took a job doing a clinical biz dev. And as with any startup, you grab an oar and you just start paddling. And so you do any job that you really need to do. I started helping out with a lot of operations and a lot of like drawing of documents and grants and whatnot. So it really was an eye opening. It was my first green perspective into a startup. And so I really valued uh, that experience and the team. And it's really great to see where they've gone because 
after being with them for a bit, it was really hard to become and stay a clinical biz dev, but traveling um, and being a mom. So I had to find something that was a little bit more of a stable job for myself. And that's when I started, uh, I talked to Bill Mayer at Ann Arbor Spark and he was like interview. So I interviewed, um, started working with them. And I guess a lot of my experiences from before, well, working with FFMI and Pathware gave me the perspective of here's Ann Arbor Spark, here's the amazing things that they're doing. Um, and now kind of with my knowledge, and there wasn't really someone who did a lot of life sciences um, and med device stuff at Spark, with me joining them, it created kind of a whole different, how can we service now all these new, let's do life science stuff. There was mm. more stuff that we could start doing and kind of really trying to chisel and help out those startups and companies. Um, not only that, but there's, there's other smart zones besides Ann Arbor Spark. Um, you know, there, there's Centropolis, there's Link Rocket, there's uh, Tech Town. Um, and now they're not necessarily a smart zone, for instance, but they definitely are part of the healthcare life science community. So Accelerate Health, there's 20 Fathoms with their Health Spark Accelerator. Getting the connections with all of these groups kind of working together, um, that was a really big piece as far as joining Spark kind of opening up programs um, and really using a lot of the connections that I had made from both um, the University of Michigan to being in the startup world, to then be a part of Spark, pulling and leveraging all those connections to kind of, let's make these programs better. Um, let's start doing a little bit more. And honestly, it came very easily. Things really easily changed around. And so, but my role is at Spark um, as director of entrepreneurial services is when, so there's, I guess, different forms of a startup. There's these ideas in the back of a beverage snack, and there's some that have an early prototype iteration. There's ones that are in pilots, and there's some that are much bigger other than that. Really where Spark can help all of the different stages, but primarily where my focus is are the very earlier parts when you still don't know what's really there, and how do you know mm. it's a good idea or not? And that's where I can come in and kind of basically do an assessment, kick the tires on an idea, and say, okay, this is what you've got going on. This is where you need a lot of support. And also you're gonna need a cheerleader because this is hard. Um, and so my job really is just kind of getting them connected, seeing if they're eligible for you know, grant funds if they're eligible, getting them to these different resources that can really help make a difference in, very early, in the very early time so that you don't spin your wills and waste mm. your time. Uh, so, with that connection or with, with Spark, it's really been an interesting um, experience for me because Spark is not just healthcare and life science, it's industry agnostic. So not only did I have to kind of wrap my head around other types of industries and whatnot, but it really, uh, there's a large part of life sciences um, and biotech as clients as part of Spark. And so a lot of those became my clients and Honestly, it was just really, it was really awesome to see how much there are and really kind of help them get a little bit further along because given my experiences and being able to advise them. Okay, so that brings us to kind of current. Yeah, so I've been with Spark. That's a, that was a, that was a fun, I wish I could give my own career history that succinctly and that, that uh, engagingly. That was awesome, Margarita. Yeah. Well, and, and just to reemphasize re what you said, I think we've seen over the years, and I've been in this community now for uh, since about uh, 2000, and, you know, Ann Arbor Spark was there and remains there and have only improved and grown yeah. all the services they offer with a, with a huge amount of consistency that they've certainly been a, a bedrock to a, uh, to the community. This seat that you have there, I think it's fascinating because you've come with a lot of knowledge of the startup world. You've even seen other accelerators like at FMI, you've been in startups. Now the seat that you're sitting in, and, and we're very well aware of the number of, like you said, early stage startups that come through, they're mm -hmm. looking for help, they're looking for services. And frankly, with um, you know a little bit of structure and, and, a, and a good idea, they, they have some eligibility. They've got something they can come talk to you about. That puts you at a nexus, at a crossroads with the background to understand it and, and, make, and to make something happen with it, to see a huge cross-section of Michigan companies, right. which I think is just, it's so interesting. And the question, you know, I'm always asking myself when it comes to, we see a huge cross-section of companies, not the same one necessarily, but 
and, and it, it leads us to lessons. It leads us to things that we just feel like, oh, we have to say that again. We've got to say that over and over again. And so I think the, the fascinating thing that you can contribute to this uh, ongoing dialogue that we have here, Margarita, is you, you probably see a wider cross-section more consistently uh, in a higher number than many people. What do you learn from your interactions with them? What kinds of lessons do you have to keep going back and telling what's, what's consistent, what's not? Um, what, what, what emerges from that? Because you're getting this, this, this wide view of so many companies at a relatively uh, detailed, intimate level. Yeah. You know, that's a really loaded question um, because there's our ecosystem is full of varieties of startups and companies that, you know, at different points um, in growth where they're at. So I'll kind of bucket it like this. Usually one of their walks into my door or in my Zoom meeting um, is either you're really green and uh, yeah, you're really green and, and this is uh, where you're at or you're really experienced and you've been around the ecosystem, you know exactly kind of what you're doing. Um, mm. and it's gonna be a more frank conversation as straight to the point, how else can I help you? These are your mitigated risk and so on and so forth. And it becomes really easy. A lot of those same people grow with the startup um, and then they end up exiting for whichever reason that startups grow. And then they wanna find their next gig. And then being able mm. to like replug in that talent kind of helps other younger talent. And so that's a big connection point of just like thinking, well, maybe, and then here's where we kind of focus really on really what the majority of the people who walk into my Zoom rooms or meeting rooms, mm. is they're green or they're still relatively young in this space with a really young idea. And so I'll spend most of my time kind of understanding what are their weaknesses and what are their strengths? And from their weaknesses, what are the things that I can help them kind of see that maybe they can't see on the other side of the mirror, walk them around the park. And a lot of it is like, you gotta get to know a person. You gotta get that trust. You gotta make mm -hmm. them laugh and connect with you. But then you gotta say, I wanna save you some time. Here's some hardship. You've got these other things kind of going on. And I don't really see any plans in your milestones of how you're gonna do risk this. So we're gonna go talk about this. Um, and here comes kind of like the next factor. Uh, who are your mentors? Who's on your advisory board? Who's a background sound for you with the exception of myself here? How else? Because ultimately what the problem ends up, I see kind of more of the stickiness of problems, it's focus. Mm. You've got a really crazy cool idea. You're really excited and passionate about it. Um, but yet you're focusing on marketing and, and some of these other things when really it's like focused on getting through the prototype make sure this thing is gonna be solid. And the reason I really try to emphasize if you're gonna build a product and especially if you're green, making sure that your first iterations are how this really fits and gets through commercialization is important. Because as you continue to grow and if you're in life science met device, you're gonna to have to talk to the FDA, you're gonna to have to get pilots, you're gonna to have to do some clinical related things possibly. There is a lot of different challenges. If you, as long as you focus on this, um, and you're getting through those hurdles of what I was just talking about as far as FDA building, you know, your, your pilots, you're building your own brand here. Just like those big people, like we all know who Christine Gibbons, we all know who Jen Beard, there's Jean. We've seen this process, but you guys have built a brand because you've done it a few times. And that's what you're trying to do right now is you're getting people to trust in your idea and trust in that you're actually focusing on what you should be doing to get through commercialization as quickly as possible, as succinctly, and you bootstrapped. That's mm. hard in itself. You don't really have time for everything else. Everything else is kind of noise. Now, for sure, people have team dynamics. There's co-founding, you know, teams of things and there's shifts, of, of, there's problems. But really just kind of continuing to focus on this. This is one of the biggest challenges that I see with a lot of startups. And so that's where a lot of me kind of being that background sound, having the mentors to kind of bring you back to orbit of, or, you know, the focus from out of your orbit, get on this. This is the most important thing. Um, mm. So I would say those are probably the most common conversations I end up having um, and kind of helping them reinforce and stick to a goal of this is what we're focused on. This is when I, we talk next, tell me where you've hit these milestones because you've hit, you know, you've, you've really focused on just your, your, your main target to get through commercialization. You know, what's fascinating about that, Margarita. I think when we have conversations with startups, we often find ourselves 
um, needing to remind them of some elements that they've forgotten that are coming down the road that they need to think about. And I, I, I fully acknowledge, and I don't think we've ever phrased it this way, and I, I appreciate you're putting it out there like this, that many times, yes, there are other things you need to think about, so don't lose them on your radar, but you can also fall into the other ditch, which is, oh, I, I had this patent thing I had to go chase after. I had this marketing thing I had to go chase after. That's <laughs> not the core thing that's going to get you across the finish line. Like, don't forget about them. Yes, that's warning number one. But you're saying you're seeing a lot of the other one, which is come back to the, come back to the core, come back to the fundamentals. Right. I mean, of course, there's always going to be patents are very important. It is. Before you start mm -hmm. really getting out there and doing all that, yes, check the boxes on that. But that shouldn't take you away completely from where you should focus your time. Um, and that's, you know, product, product, making sure your product is the best that it actually can be 70, 75% of the way, because mm. the rest of it will work itself out. But if it's a, you know, don't aim for 100%, aim for something a little bit smaller, but do it right and be mm. confident with what your product is. And that means going through the process of talking with like groups like yours. What do you guys think? Because you're going to ask, you're going to ask questions too. Like, have you done enough customer discovery? What does, who are the buyers? Um, what do they have to say about going through these processes? Like really continuing to focus on these things that are just really critical and key for early parts of startups. Well, it's interesting yeah. you say it that way because I know we've all seen those startups which you hear about them and then you hear about them again and you hear about them again and you're still seeing the same pictures and ideas but you haven't seen where the progress actually came and that progress is very fundamental to the core. What are you, what are you going to be selling here? What's, what is this? Thing? Right. Right. I think that's a, that's a great reminder, Margarita. Um, give us a quick overview too. I want to make sure we get this in here. Give us a quick overview of if somebody is thinking about a startup or has a startup, mm -hmm. and they want to come to Spark, they want to come to you or one of the folks there. What's an appropriate stage? When should they be, when should they be coming and, and having a conversation? Anytime. As I was saying, Spark covers from an idea of the back of a beverage napkin to you got a prototype and it's kind of skeleton kind of working, or you have gotten past that point and you are trying to maybe find team members, or you are honestly, it doesn't really matter. Everything under the sky is really um, some amount of Spark. It just depends on where you get bucketed. Are you really, really, really early? Like you're not making, you haven't raised 5 million or you haven't made revenue of 5 million or you're definitely after that, then there's a whole, there's a business team, uh, business development team here at Spark that's basically, let me help you find talent, your next office. Mm -hmm. Let me help you find grants from the state to help fortify yourself here. A lot of that. So it really just depends. There's no, there's no where you need to be as long. Primarily though, it has to be tech. That's, that's our one role. It's tech. It's got to be tech. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. So people can reach out uh, for that. One of the things that you mentioned earlier, Margarita, was that your the passion that ties us all together is sort of constantly learning. You described your history um, yep. and going through this process, which is like, well, Bench is great, but I want to know more about this. And you, you discovered the startup world and you're starting to read uh, business cases and, and things like that. And, oh, and, and, and of course, I, you and I both know that you, you end up getting your, your hands really messy when you get into the startup world. So suddenly you find yourself back at a bench doing something that's like, oh, I thought I was done doing this. But um, tell us uh, some of the things that, have, that, have, that you've, you've noted along the way that have been um, really fueled that passion for continuous learning. Any anecdotes there? Well, I always say this one uh, to many of my clients, um, especially when I mentor Si se puede, which is yes, yes, you can in Spanish. My mother taught it to me because literally I was really intimidated by science. I had a lot of imposter syndrome kind of getting into it. But the best part is set aside from imposter syndrome and everything else is the curiosity uh, of learning. And that's actually one of the best things about working at Spark or just in our world, period, tech. You, there's never a dull moment. There's always new tech. Um, and the most interesting thing for me at least is what is actually going on under the hood, how is it actually working? How do you how do you know that that is what it is? What are your controls? Like really, what is the the fiber of what this tech is built on tech built on tech? Because everything is fundamental at some point, built on built on built on all this other taking it apart and putting it back together. That's that's what I really enjoy. Mm. And 
I guess when we were speaking earlier, you know, I was really kind of unpacking uh, things that interested me and kind of like the learning experience, um, what continues to drive. But when I was working for Fast Forward Medical Innovation, um, I was also supporting a class for uh, biomedical uh, senior design with Rachel Smedlin. And these are where students basically get to work with a startup, a company, and they basically start iterating and building different prototypes. And we kind of guide them through the commercialization or you know, design controls and whatnot. And at, right before that class where the projects get sourced for that class are through another class that happens earlier in the summer. And that's where uh, Rachel kind of has these students go around and in the case uh, for, for med device really, she would have these students enroll in what a class is called ethnography. Now, ethnography is the observations of watching people do things and kind of making mental notes. You don't know what, like you may not know what they're doing, but they're doing it. But you're mm. watching their faces. You're looking at how much time they're spending. Um, then you go talk to them and they kind of tell you what's going on and you kind of hear their voice. You're observing pain. You're observing behaviors. You're and what that class really struck out to me was you get this opportunity to see <clears throat> in, in this case, where in the clinic, where in the surgical room, where um, in the hospital, do you see that doctors are just doing these things, but they don't see what's right in front of them is still a problem. It's, it's been, they've been doing it for 20 years. There's room for innovation. And so this class allowed an opportunity to kind of rethink and then just have another bright eyed, bushy tailed student why? Why is that happening? Why? Mm. Why? Why? And really take that information back into, is there really a problem here? Are you really going to make a solution necessarily? No, you're continuing to iterate. But really part of the problem is understanding the human concept of how people do a routine. How do they execute doing this? And how do they react to it? How are they going to feel? And so whenever I talk to my clients, they're building something amazing. They're gonna change you know, health, life care, people's experiences and doing something, yay. But really, how is that gonna fit into the human routine? How is, is this gonna be a dynamic shift for them? How are you gonna help them better understand what's going on to help them make a decision to actually go with this type of pacemaker versus this one or whatever? There's a lot of human aspects to, especially when you get into healthcare, making sure that people understand and are educated enough that they can make those decisions, that they understand what's going on and unpacking tech in a very simplified way so that people can easily understand it, but that you're redeveloping a tech that is a trusted brand. You're gonna get, that's a very important part, making sure that there's the right fit with people and it fits into their routines um, and making sure you're helping them navigate that is a really important factor. And so that is part of the critical um, taking apart a problem and reassembling how you're going to make it work. So both curiosity, learning um, all about tech, but also considering the human factor of this and how mm. are you going to make sure that your device, your therapeutic, your diagnostic is still human and how do you plan to really continue that commercialization with that mindset that you're going to have to educate, you're going to have to inform um, and build something that's for, it feels good for everybody. Mm. <laughs> Margarita Hernandez, it's so good to have you today. Such a such a whirlwind tour, uh, but so spot on. Can't tell you how much I appreciate what you're doing with uh, with Ann Arbor Spark and and for our community. Um, absolutely. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention: if you have any people out there that are looking for interns for this summer, um, Ann Arbor Spark has a new program called Michigan STEM Forward, and these are where interns who are getting ready to graduate, maybe have graduated a few months out already. Um, want to get connected to companies and whatnot, definitely go check out Michigan STEM Ford at annarborusa.org. Um, just check out our website to go look at the program. Um, basically, it's a one-to-one -one match. So for companies, and it can be anywhere in the state, any company part of the state, any intern part of the state are eligible to get signed on um, and find that talent. Um, and basically what will end up happening is that the company will pay for half and then we'll match the dollar per dollar point and deal with all the administrative things for that company. Yeah, just trying to help retain our talent, keep it here in the state, and especially help our companies grow. Well, that is awesome. Thank you for that uh, for that tidbit. And yeah. as always, any announcements, uh, feel free to bring them on. We love to spread those around. Margarita Hernandez, thank you so much for being with us today.
Thank you, Jean. It was nice seeing you and I hope you have a great Friday and that goes for everybody else out there. You too. Thanks for being here. Yep. Take care. Well, that's awesome. Next up, I want to take you into Medical Device Development Month, which is what we're calling the month of May. And if you happen to be looking at your calendar, you know that it's not quite May yet. But we thought, hey, who cares? We're going to do it anyways because it's almost May. Let's bring up a screen share here to show you. Medical Device Development Month at MedTech Crossroads. Here's what we want to talk about, a uh, few topics, uh, one of which is still in development, but today we're going to be talking about it's compelling, but does it work? We actually weren't talking about this uh, with Margarita, and it turns out that this, uh, what she talked about today, really lines up with, uh, with our topics today, because she was asking companies to focus on their fundamentals, and uh, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today in our uh, development segment after that, next week, the real meaning of development iterations. After that, uh, this one's uh, kind of, uh, it's going to be fun. Be objective, the meaning behind the ceremony. Wow, that'll get you thinking. And then at the end of the month, we're going to have a session on turnoffs with our pitch party judges. Not what do they like, but what turns them off. We're not going to do that in any specific context of any specific companies. We just want to hear from them. What doesn't work when you hear about a new medical device development what do you not want to hear? And so that'll be fun at the end of the month. But for today, it's compelling, but does it work? Well, it's a really important question. If you've been a listener to MedTech Crossroads, you know that we are great fans of the Kinevin framework, um, a wonderful uh, thought framework developed by Dave Snowden in 1999 while he was at IBM. And it helps us to understand that there are different domains where our project and our understanding of that project can fall. There's a clear domain, which is where we all want to be. It's the mountaintop experience. Everything is known and familiar, and you just do what you know, and it all works out beautifully. So why doesn't life always work out that way? Well, it largely has to do with the fact that there are other domains. There's a complicated domain. We might be familiar with what's happening in that domain, and it's knowable but there are gonna be some unknowns and things we have to figure out. And then there's also a complex domain where there's a lot of unknowns. We know that there are unknowns. There might even be unknown unknowns. And then there's a chaotic domain where things aren't even knowable. Well, we, don't, we wanna stay away from the chaotic domain when we're in product development. But frequently we find ourselves in the complex or the complicated domains. And you've heard us talk about this before. Today, we want to get just one step more practical. What does this look like? What kinds of challenges do you run into as a product development company, as a startup? What kinds of problems do you run into and how do you solve them? Or how could you have done it better? We're going to learn from some case studies. But first, this development is a process by which we learn from where we were to move to where we need to be. That's what development is. If you could just say from the beginning what something needs to be, you would do it. But the reason we call it development is because it develops over time. If anyone remembers those things we used to call photographs that developed on a piece of chemical paper, it took time for the image to develop. And so it is with products. They emerge over time based on what you've learned from where you were. Development is all about discovering and solving unknowns. Now, there's two ways to imagine this. Two ways to imagine this. Development is like balancing a plate. Okay, I don't have a plate here or I would demonstrate it live in the studio and make a fool of myself. But development is like balancing a plate. You can imagine if you have a plate and you put your finger underneath, it's pretty easy to figure out where does the plate balance. I hope you're all pointing at your screens right now. Where does this plate balance? Put your finger on where it balances. And if you put an X right about there, congratulations, you're right. You're a product developer. You just solved that problem. But let's develop the slightly more complex product. Now, where does the plate balance? There's a hole in the plate. Well, it's not going to balance right in the center anymore. So if you said a little bit off to the right, well, you'd be right. That's about where the plate's going to balance if we got that at all correct. But what about this? 
Now where does the plate balance? Oh boy, that's a much harder question. Give me a minute, I'll, I'll work on it, I'll figure it out. I hope we can see the analogy here. There's unknowns in the world of product development. There's variables, and there's usually more variables and more unknowns than we ourselves are aware of. Sure, there are some things in the clear domain, but there are also things in the complex domain that we have to find out what they even are before we can solve them. And this is what leads to much of the iteration in product development. Some of these things could relate to things like user needs, some which we know, some which we don't. The reimbursement landscape for a medical device, some of which we know, some of which we don't. Some of the risks inherent in the device that are gonna need solutions. Tolerances associated with our components. Availability of our components. We've heard many stories of a product being designed only to find that the components used to design it are no longer available. Well, that's gonna set you back. What about the basic laws of physics? We've encountered many devices that want to violate the laws of physics. Well, that's not gonna work very well. And like our friend Margarita just mentioned, human behavior. How humans actually use and interact with devices in real world situations is one of the biggest unknowns of all that often sets back product development efforts. So how does product development actually happen if we acknowledge that this analogy of a plate that you're trying to balance but has all these unknown weightings to it is a good model for product development? Here's how product development actually happens. You don't see a plate. You don't see any weights. You don't see any holes you don't know where to put your finger. And so you do the best you can, but there's a cloud, a cloud of unknowns surrounding the product that you're trying to develop. Remember, these aren't all technical. We're gonna to talk today about some technical aspects. They're not all technical. Some are market, some are reimbursement, et cetera. Maybe you've got some great mentors, some great consultants, and they're able to point out a few places where even though there's a cloud there, they know that there's a hole there, something that's going to unbalance the plate. And so you do your best. You take a stab and you put down an X where you think the center is, where it's going to balance, where it's all going to work. Well, inevitably, that's not where it balances. That's not where it balances. But what has that just taught you? It's taught you that now, well, since it fell that direction, there must be something that I was missing. You find it, you identify it, you try again, and you repeat this process until you've refined that product. Today we wanted to look at a few very, very simple case studies. What are these about? They're really all about finding unknowns in the best, most efficient way possible. Here's the first one, and I have to obfuscate these for obvious reasons. This is a device uh, that we were asked to be part of that involved pumping, pumping mechanism. Well, you can think of a pumping mechanism as being like a syringe, like a cylinder that has something that moves back and forth. Let's use that as an example of the technical reality behind this project. Pretty pictures were done. They existed. That's always a great start. It was a pumping mechanism that had to be disposable and low cost. But there were questions. There were variables. Sealing and cylindricity of these uh, parts of the product. What actually happened? As the most obvious steps were taken, like, oh, we're gonna injection mold this product, and make perfect sense. Nothing this big had ever been done in quite this way. If you know anything about injection molding, you know that walls can't be parallel to each other in much of injection molding practice. And so there was now the potential for a leak path for this thing, where fluid would leak out past a part of the device. Well, at that point, the company had already been so committed to their idea, their pretty pictures and everything else. The only path forward was to do lots of work in design and manufacturing to ensure that the product would work. That always results in a product that costs more than you expect it to. What would have been a better solution? Well, at least consider design for manufacturing early in the process. We'll talk in a minute about how that gets incorporated. But there's an example of a variable that was discovered along the way, along with an idea that maybe it could have been discovered in another way. 
Here's an example of a drug delivery system. What does it take to deliver a drug? Well, it takes something to hold the drug and something to dispense the drug. And in fact, that's what the company had envisioned. And they put a cool box around it. They were able to say, here's something to hold the drug and something to dispense the drug. And they made pretty pictures. Did you hear that again? Pretty pictures of what they wanted. Well, only to find out that the drug has only ever been held in glass, never in plastic before, and that safety mechanisms that they had never heard of are industry standard on such devices. What this did was to basically destroy the entire concept around which the product would have been sold. All the initial work to get people excited in the idea, now that they had to expand the form factor beyond what was expected, really was a setback because they hadn't evaluated the standards that applied, the industry practices that had applied early enough to have them affect their product development process. Here's another example, a filtering device. Once again, pretty pictures were complete. A filter needed to be compact. Space was allotted on the basis of aesthetics, what would look good and be happily usable. Well, during development, it was discovered that more filter area was needed. What was the solution? Lots of additional work that would not have been there had requirements been defined early on with cheap, affordable, quick bench test beds. In other words, there was a variable. That variable was knowable, but it wasn't known. And the work wasn't done early, so it had to be done late at more expense and more effort and more setbacks. What we're talking about here is how early can you discover a missing variable in your product development process and how much money and time will that save you later? I'm gonna give you one more example. <clears throat> this of a radio frequency surgical tool. It worked great on bench test beds. We got to animal testing. We discovered something. It only worked on males. It didn't work on females. If you just stopped when you heard that, you should, because that was a huge question mark. It turns out in the world of radio frequency surgery, whole body electrical resistance, or as it's actually called impedance, is different for males and females in the mammalian world. And that matters not in your run-of-the-mill radio frequency electrical electrosurgical device, but when you're at the limits of performance, when you're designing something that's really cutting edge. The only solution available in this case was partial redevelopment of the device. Was there a better solution available? This is the challenge of product development because sometimes there would have been a cheap, easy, affordable way to know better, and sometimes there isn't. Sometimes that is what you're there to do during product development, is to find those unknowns, even though they were unknown unknowns, and to solve them. So hopefully this gives you a little sense of what these variables feel like in medical device technical product development. But here's the final word on it. Does this seem like an amorphous process? It's not, because this is exactly what the FDA recognizes needs to be done. This is the heart and soul of design controls. It's something that's laid out in a graphic very nicely that has been seen time and time again. That if at each stage of a development process, you consider the user needs, the design inputs, the design outputs, the finished medical device through verification and validation at increasing levels of scrutiny, all the while with appropriate review, Margarita on just a little while ago mentioned to us that you have to have advisors who are able to tell you what you should be looking for. And if you have them available at the review points that you've selected for your medical device development, they're gonna be the ones to help you find out, did we catch unknown variables at these stage appropriate points? Don't wait till design output to find out that you missed a variable that you could have easily caught at design input. Don't wait for design input to catch a variable that you know you could just ask a user and find out what mattered to them. And that's how you move through the process in a sane manner, 
not losing your head about it, and also not stifling development, because frankly, development needs to be lean. It needs to be in a sandbox. You've got to have the freedom to try things, and that's what this kind of a process does for you. But here's the point. Development's a process by which we learn from where we were to move to where we need to be. Development is all about discovering and solving unknowns. It's not about doing just what we have always known to, do, to have done. It's discovering those unknowns, doing it through a process, and doing it with uh, the advisors and resources that this entire community uh, brings to you. So hopefully that's a little bit of an insight when you go back to whatever project you're working on. I hope you'll ask, what are the known unknowns that we have that we're trying to solve? And let's keep an eye out there for the unknown unknowns. And let's ask people, am I missing anything here? Things will go a lot better. That's the end of that segment that we have there. I want to just take a moment to open it up to any questions or comments that we might have uh, from our online audience. Also, community check-ins are welcome. If you have something you'd like to tell us that's happening in the community, we would welcome that, and uh, that will go into the record for people to find online. We have a hand from our friend Ken Spencer. Ken, it's good to hear your voice. Yes, Gene, very interesting segment, both from Margarita and, and yourself out there. Um, maybe I could give you an anecdote. After my Navy career was over, I went to work for Texas Instruments in uh, both industrial and, and commercial or consumer controls out there. And we had big contracts with General Electric. And um, this was 20 years ago or right, kind of thing. So. Um, we found the same thing, the male female thing with capacitive touch on, on early microwaves. Wow. It was like, it worked for all the male guys. It didn't work for the female guys. I mean, it, it was like totally unknown to anybody, you know, at the time. So the other thing was um, they asked us to do an early digital control for their ovens, right? This was way before now everybody's got stuff out there, right? You know. But this was like, they, they just wanted to press ahead. So um, we found that the, the hysteresis in the oven was just like crazy, you know, kind of thing. Mm. So, so we went to San Diego to a military contractor to build a, a nickel cadmium temperature probe that was accurate to within a hundred, hundredth of a degree, right? So we, we come back and the GE guys, and by the way, I was there at the meeting there all males, right? We're all sitting around the table and they're like, wow, this is great, you know, kind of thing, right? Well, they're, they have a test kitchen in, in GE there where they bake a certain kind of cake or something like that. And of course, uh, it was all women baking it at that time, right? They come in and they're just laughing their tails off like, you guys are idiots, you know, because we come in and the cake was like a brick. I mean, you couldn't even cut it. Because the way all the recipes are built on is that cheap, you know, coil sensor in there is built on this hysteresis, you know, in there temperature going up and temperature going down and up and down and up and down kind of thing, right? So we go back and we had to build in hysteresis into this thing, you know, so we turned to, it was a $20 control and for 250 bucks, you know, you could replicate that. So that was the end of that experiment, you know. So these are the unknown known kind of things that I, I run into, like you said. Those are some great examples, Ken. In fact, it's, it's interesting because I think as we go through um, really history, right, and as regulatory science develops and people are looking at things, increasingly standards and, and regulatory bodies will recognize these kinds of things. An example of what you just mentioned, like, um, you know, uh, well, it worked for all the males, but no one ever thought to, to try it with the females. One of the things that FDA says very clearly um, and, and tries very hard when clinical testing is necessary, they don't want to give you a clearance for a demographic that you haven't tested it on. And if the, uh, if the sex of the user or, the, uh, or, or other um, racial demographics uh, have any reason to participate in how well the device would work, they're cognizant of it. And now they will actually uh, pause you and say, hold on, uh, we might give you clearance for this demographic, but not for that one. Go back and do your homework. So uh, great examples, Ken. Thanks for that, for those memories. We'll uh, leave it open for just another minute, see if there's any other Q&A 
or any other community check-ins, we'd love to hear from you if there's anything you'd like the community to know. And not seeing any, we are at the top of the hour. So I want to thank you for being here on MedTech Crossroads with us. Always good to have you. We're looking forward to next week. Uh, we'll see you back here, same time, same channel. Talk soon. Bye-bye.